Okay, we're ready. Great. Well, welcome everybody to Elasma Week. My name is Dr. David Schiffman and I will be your MC for this week. Our first speaker uh, is Jasmine Graham. Jasmine specializes in elasmobranch ecology and evolution. Her past research interests include small tooth sawfish movement ecology and hammerhead shark phylogeny. She's a member of the American Elasmobranch Society and serves on their student action committee. Jasmine received her BS in marine biology and BA in Spanish with a minor in linguistics from the College of Charleston. And she received her master's in, Mar in biological science from Florida State University. Jasmine completed internships with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, Fort Johnson Marine Lab, and Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, Division of Marine Fisheries Management. She's also worked as an instructor for the Saturday at the Sea program through Florida State University's uh, Office of STEM Teaching Activities and served as the outreach coordinator for the Ecology and Evolution Graduate Student Organization at FSU. Jasmine has a passion for science education and making marine science more accessible to everyone. She is the project coordinator for the Marsai Lace Project at Moat Marine Lab, which is focused on researching and promoting best practices to recruit, support, and retain minority students in marine science. In addition to her work at Moat, Jasmine is the co-founder of a brand new organization called Minorities in Shark Sciences, AKA MISS. MISS is an organization dedicated to supporting and amplifying voice, uh, marginalized voices in shark science. She is excited to help open doors for more underrepresented minority students to join the exciting field of marine science. And you can follow her on Twitter at Elasmo underscore gal. Jasmine, take it away. Awesome, thank you. All right, let me go ahead and get my screen up. Okay, oh, hold on. Actually, I forgot to do something. Gotta share my sound. Okay, so I am going to talk about um, some very bizarre shaped chondrichthians today. Um, so for fans of Harry Potter out there, I've titled this talk, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, Bizarre Chondrichthians. So first off, I wanna talk about what is a chondrichthian. So a chondrichthian is a fish that's made of cartilage. Um, so instead of having bones, like you or I have, um, their actual, their skeletal system is made up of cartilage, just like we have in our nose and our ears. And this makes them super lightweight, very hydrodynamic, um, super bendy, able to take tight turns and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to being made out of cartilage. Um, but today I'm gonna be talking about some of my favorite chondrichthians. So I'm really interested in animals that are weirdly shaped. So I'm gonna talk about today hammerheads and sawfish. So first I'm gonna talk about hammerheads. So I am an um, ecologist, um, but also I have a background in evolution. And so I kind of look at chondrichthians from all sides. So what is their ecology? Where do they live? What's their life history? Um, how do they grow? Where do they mate? Where do they pup or lay their eggs or whatever? Um, so that's what I'm interested in the ecological side, but I'm also interested in who's related to who, particularly with these weird shaped animals like hammerheads. What's up with that hammer? So I'm interested in understanding who's related to who so I can understand how this super bizarre trait of having this really wide head, uh, which is called a cephalofoil, how that came to be. And if it's beneficial, what, is, what are they using it for? If it's not beneficial, how did this happen? That seems like such a random thing for you to have. Um, and so I'm interested in understanding the evolution of these guys just because I find them fascinating because you look at that winghead shark there and you say, how does that exist? Why is its head so big? Its head is actually um, three fourths the length of its body. 
um, which is like, why is your head that wide? <laughs> so that's something that's been interesting to me. So that's something that I did research on a couple of years ago. Um, and I'm working on publishing this um, right now, actually. So what I did for this project, I kind of did two different parts. I did anatomical, so looking at the anatomy of the hammerheads. And I did that in a non-invasive way um, so that it didn't require, you know, sacrificing a lot of animals. I did this actually by CT scanning museum specimens so that I could digitally dissect them and see all of the structures um, without having to go out and sacrifice animals to do dissection. So I used the museum specimens all already available and was able to CT scan them so that I could return them back to the museum whole uh, so other people could use them for other things. So it's a really sustainable way to do this kind of research. The other part I looked at was the DNA. So I looked at mitochondrial DNA, um, which is DNA stored in the mitochondria, which is different from the, the DNA stored in the nucleus. Uh, first of all, it's much shorter. There's a lot less base pairs, all those A, T, G things. Um, and then also it is a little bit slower to evolve because your mitochondrial DNA comes just from the mother. Um, so there's not as much DNA mixing um, by adding in that paternal DNA. So I looked at mitochondrial DNA and used CT scans, which um, is kind of a novel approach to look at this particular group of animals. So I wanted to see if I came up with something different from what people have found in the past. So first off, before we start talking about hammerheads, let's go ahead and say, there are many species of hammerheads. So there was a poll that we ran um, before I went on the graduate students of oceanography, the University of Rhode Island's little um, classroom, their GSO classroom, ran a poll to see how many species people thought there were of hammerheads. And there were a lot of people um, that don't think that there's very many, that there's between one and four hammerhead species. Well, let me tell you, there's actually 10 species of hammerheads. Um, and I have this little asterisk here because we're finding new species um, in science in general across the animal kingdom all the time. And we actually have recently described and verified two different um, species of hammerheads. One of which is what we call a cryptic species, the Carolina hammerhead. So the Carolina hammerhead looks exactly like the scalloped hammerhead on the outside, just from looking at it. The only way that scientists were able to actually identify that it's a different species was from looking at its DNA. And even when people did dissections, it's really hard to tell them apart even from the inside. The easiest way to do it is to count the vertebrae because they have a different number of vertebrae. But basically, if you see a shark that looks like a scalloped hammerhead, you can't just from looking at it on the spot tell whether it is a scalloped hammerhead or a Carolina hammerhead. So that's why we call it cryptic because it's hidden. And what's really interesting is that they have maintained two separate species even though they look exactly the same. So what that tells us is they can at least tell each other apart, which is super interesting. So there's something different about them um, that's very clear to them, um, so much so that they're not really mixing as much. Uh, so it's really interesting when we find things like that cryptic species. So 10 species of hammerheads, rare, um, various sizes. Uh, so we've got the great hammerhead, uh, which is our, our biggest of the hammerheads. Then we've got tiny little bonnet heads, um, which are more like small coastal species. We have hammerheads that live um, in the coast and really shallow. We have uh, hammerheads that live offshore. We have pelagic hammerheads. It's really interesting um, within this family, we have a wide range of different lifestyles, like where they live, what they eat, 
Um, so the bonnet head is actually the first known omnivorous shark, which is super cool. So they actually eat seagrass and can digest it and can get nutrients from it. Um, they are omnivorous. So they can eat um, the seagrass, they can eat vegetation, or they can eat things like fish, small crustaceans, and meat and stuff like that. So that's really interesting because up until this point, we thought that all sharks were exclusively carnivorous. Um, so there's a lot of really cool things happening in the hammerhead family, which is why I find um, studying their evolution, who's related to who, very interesting. So for this project, I did something that was called building a phylogeny, which is basically a family tree. So you can think of this, I'm sure you guys have seen family trees, maybe you've even um, drawn out your own family tree. So whenever you have two branches, that means that those are, are very closely related. And you can see that whenever these two branches join together, that would be representing the common ancestor that both of those two sister taxa, we call them sister taxa, um, shared. And so you can have like B and C or sister taxa, they're related to A, but not as closely as they are to each other. So B is more closely related to C. Um, and then if you go further back in history, so this green box is the common ancestor of B and C, and this orange box is the common ancestor of all three of them. So at some point, they were all, uh, they all shared a common ancestor and then they slowly broke off. So that's what I kind of am trying to identify. Who's related to who? Who is the most closely related to what we call the out group, which is the sharks that are most closely related to the family of hammerheads, but aren't hammerheads. So basically, just trying to understand where all of these different species of sharks fall on the family tree, because that's gonna tell us the story of how this hammer evolved over time. And the reason why this is a particularly interesting question is because there's actually multiple hypotheses about how these hammerheads are related to each other. So there's a hypothesis that's based off of anatomical data. So just looking at the structure of the organisms themselves. And we see if we go from left to right, it's oldest, um, so the most basal or the closest to the outgroup um, to the most recently evolved. And if you look at it, the heads actually are getting bigger over time. So this is what we worked with for a long time. And so people looked at that and they said, okay, over time they're evolving bigger heads. Obviously the head has some sort, gives them some sort of advantage. Um, so it's a positive thing. And that's why they keep evolving bigger heads. So then the next question is, what do they do with the heads? And so lots of scientists have been researching this. There's lots of hypotheses out there about what they do with their heads, um, ranging in, um support um so a couple of them so they have these sensory um organs that uh, spaces them out so you know they have a higher surface area that they can sense things so people are like there you go that's the advantage another advantage is it gives them stereoscopic vision so their eyes sit outside out here and so it gives them more of a 360 view of things that's one theory um, some people say, some scientists have um, posited that maybe it's used for digging or flipping over stingrays or whatever. There's lots of different things. Um, some scientists have suggested it's um, used as kind of a rudder, helps them make turns and things like that. Um, so there's lots of different hypotheses um, of what the hammer is used for. But then, um, a few years ago, um, Dr. Gavin Naylor did the DNA with the nuclear DNA in the nucleus. And they actually found uh, in his lab this phylogeny that you see on the bottom, which looks a lot different from what you see on the top. So this kind of looks like the heads are getting smaller 
over time, which is really interesting because what that tells us is that if um, the wing head, the one with the widest head evolved first and all of these other ones have smaller heads, that might actually tell us that this head isn't beneficial at all. And they've actually been trying to get rid of it. And it was a really strong mutation that happened and it wasn't super detrimental. So they were able to survive with it and reproduce and pass on this trait of having wide heads, but it's not actually super useful. Um, and so it's kind of gradually disappearing. So this kind of is jarring to how we traditionally think about evolution being really slow incremental changes um, and not this massive mutation that happened um, and then suddenly there was a shark with a really wide head and this family has been getting smaller heads over time. That kind of is counterintuitive to what we typically think about for evolution. So not only are these two um, hypotheses in direct contrast, the molecular hypothesis actually challenges the way we traditionally think or thought about evolution. So this was something that was really interesting that I wanted to look into further, but I wanted to use some different methods to see if I got different results. So as I mentioned, I CT scanned the animals. Uh, I decided to ignore the head completely because I thought that that might drive the evolutionary history. Um, and then, so I wanted to look at all of the other characteristics. So what if we ignored the head and we looked at everything else? So we weren't influenced by what was happening with the head. And so then I did the phylogeny for that. And then I also, as I mentioned, used mitochondrial DNA um, and also resequenced the nuclear DNA just to be better safe than sorry. And um, created some phylogenies off of that to compare them. So a lot of people ask me, okay, you were CT scanning sharks. Is this the same kind of CT scan that people do? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> and so we actually went to Medical University of South Carolina, MUSC, and used their CT scanner there. Um, so the exact same scanner that people go through. Uh, we did it after hours. So after all the people have gone through, we came in with our little sharks and wrapped the thing up so it didn't get all of its like sharkiness everywhere. And then they had the evening to clean it off and everything before they took patients again in the morning. So same machine, obviously the CT scanners are designed for people. People are made of bones. Um, sharks are made of cartilage. So that means that some of the scans don't come out super clean. Uh, so they look kind of like a polar bear in a snowstorm for a little bit. Um, and so this is where my digital segmentation comes in, where I actually use a, pro a computer program called MIMIX to um, individually separate out all of the structures in this shark. So at the end of all of that, I have this um, image. So I have each of these little structures separated out and they're all color coded all nicely and labeled over here so I can look at specific structures. So right now I'm going to show you what it looks like. Oh, hold on. It's not sharing it. Okay, let me do to do. All right, so this is what it looks like whenever I'm doing the segmentation. So you'll see I have these multiple windows that are showing different transects of the scan. And then in this bottom window that I'm actually working in, I can actually see the 3D representation of the scan. And I can actually go in and remove all of the parts that I'm not interested in looking at right now. So this is how I separate out the individual structures. So right now I'm saying, okay, this is the structure that I'm interested in. So I'm going to create a layer and then I'm going to remove everything else from this animal so that I'm just left with 
the piece that I'm interested in. And I'll do this repeatedly. So I do this one structure at a time. So I would do this structure and then I would copy the original layer again um, into a new layer and I would separate out another structure and I would label that layer based off of the structure. So I go piece by piece, one at a time. And this is a real time video, by the way. This is like actually how long it took me to separate out these two little tiny pieces. I picked the smallest and easiest to segment pieces for this video, so it would be kind of short. Um, but this is real time. Some of the scans are messier than others, and it takes me a little bit more time. But um, typically, it took me anywhere from six to 20 hours to, to scan, uh, to segment each of these scans out. And there you have it. I have my little pieces. So that's kind of how this process works. And so once I've done all of that, then I can start looking at the phylogeny. So basically I looked at um, 42 different characters. I was looking at how similar they look to each other, different structures based on the shape, based on the width, based on the length, things like that to see um, which structures were most similar to each other. Um, and basically created what's called a character matrix where you say, this one is most similar to this one in this character, but most similar to that one in this character. And you take all of those and there's this computational program that I put that in and it tells me, okay, according to these characters, if we're grouping these by similarity, these are the ones that are most similar. The next similar would be this one. The next similar would be this one. And so what I ended up with was this phylogeny. So I had two groups basically. So at the bottom here, the loxodon and scoliodon, uh, those are the out groups. So they're not hammerheads. You can see they don't have the hammer shaped head. So that's what I was comparing it to. And then I have two of the groups in the hammerheads. So what I have is, um, the large sharks with pretty large heads grouped with that one small shark with a huge head. And then the rest of them are small sharks with small heads. Um, so we've got kind of these two distinct groups. But then I did the molecular data, um, which basically involved a lot of pipetting and heating and cooling and extracting DNA and finding, uh, creating what's called libraries where you have specific um, pieces of DNA that stick to your DNA that you extracted from the animal and pulls it apart so that you can reassemble it in order um, and get your whole DNA sequence. And then I did the similar thing that I did with the anatomical DNA where it looks at every base pair in this sequence and it says, okay, it's similar here to this one, but it's more similar here to that one. And it does the same computation and says, this one has more, these two have more similarities than this one has to this one and so on and so forth. And we actually see a similar grouping um, where you have the large sharks with fairly large heads um, coming out with the small shark with the super big head, the wing headed shark. And then you've got the, the um, group with the small bodies and small heads, but it's a little bit different. So it's flipped where again, the small heads appear to be more recent than the big heads. So we still kind of have disagreement, even though we have these two groups, the order which these groups fall is different. So still didn't get a consensus, but what I noticed um, was that this is likely what we call a rooting problem. And to have a tree, you need roots. So just like normal trees out in the world, you got to have roots for trees. So this is the origin of the tree. And sometimes it's really hard mathematically to find where the origin of the tree is if your group of animals is really distantly related to your outgroup animals. 
So if there was a long period of time between when the outgroup sharks came into existence and when the current group of hammerheads that we have now came into existence, then there's so much time where evolution has happened that we can't account for that it messes up our estimate. So now what we have to do, just like science does a lot, we answered our question with a question. So they're actually in agreement. The problem is the root. So then you got to go figure out, well, where does the root go? Um, and there's a lot of different methods that we're using to try and figure that out. And so you'll have to stay tuned on that. Um, once that paper comes out to find out uh, if we were able to find the root of the problem. So that's what we're, ha what, that's what we're working on now with the hammerheads. Um, so whenever people ask you why do hammerheads have their hammer, you could say, we don't know, because we don't know. And we don't even know if the hammer is beneficial. Um, so lots of questions with the hammerhead family. Um, and their mystery is what really intrigues me and why um, I continue to do work with hammerheads, um, looking not only at their evolution, but their ecology. Here's me just this week, um, tagging a hammerhead um, out in the Keys. And so I continue to work with hammerheads, continue to find them fascinating. But I also now do work with the small tooth sawfish, another weirdly shaped chondrichthian. So the small tooth sawfish is this ray that's flat. Um, it's a ray, but it kind of looks like a shark. It's like if a ray and a shark were like mixed, it's weird. So they have the ray, their ray features where they're flat, they've got their mouth and their gills on the bottom. But then they also have this tail that's like shark-like and these dorsal fins and like the bottom half of them is weird. And then their nose is weird. What's going on with that? They've got this long um, snout with these teeth coming off of it, which aren't really teeth, um, but they've got these things that look like teeth coming off of them. And it's just weird. Like they got a giant saw strap to their face. What's up with that? Um, so, of course, me being a person that's interested in weird looking chondrichthians, I wanted to, to um, look into them more. So, the small tooth sawfish is just one of the species of sawfish, um, but the, saw, the sawfish family is one of the most endangered um, elasmobranch species in the world. And so, the small tooth sawfish specifically is critically endangered which is that notch right before extinct um, when you're looking at the, the IUCN red list. So these guys are really cute when they're born. Um, this is a little baby. You'll notice that it has a little gelatinous sheath over its teeth because nature always finds a way. Um, so sawfish are born live. So like you can imagine if you're a mama sawfish, you don't want to give birth to several saws. That's not fun. Um, so they actually have this gelatinous sheath that protects the mother um, whenever she's um, birthing these sawfish. So the sawfish are born um, about 70 to 80 centimeters in length. Um, but when they, they mature at about 250 to 380 centimeters, but crazily, they go from like 70 centimeters more than 500 centimeters. So they get to be like 16 feet long, which is ridiculous. That is huge. Um, so imagine this huge animal with this long saw on its face, pretty crazy. Um, so the small tooth sawfish is found in US waters. It's the only sawfish species still found in US waters. We used to have two species in the United States. The large tooth sawfish, in addition to the small tooth sawfish, but unfortunately, the large tooth sawfish um, no longer exists in the United States, which is super sad. Um, and the small tooth sawfish almost suffered a similar fate. Their range decreased really dramatically. They had a huge drop in population numbers, um, and that's one of the reasons why they are 
really struggling um, because not only did they lose a lot of their population, they lost a lot of their habitat. Um, so they, they're they dealing with that. They're also dealing with um, threats that are more anthropogenic, although the losing their habitat is kind of our fault too, unfortunately. But um, they have issues with inter interactions with fisheries. So they get caught in what's um, like incidental or bycatch, um, which is where they're not actually fishing for sawfish, but they accidentally catch them because you can imagine they have this big long saw on their face and they're easily able to get tangled up in fishing gear and things like that. And so particularly with nets like shrimp trawls and, and gill nets and things like that, um, it's basically a death sentence for a sawfish to get caught in one of those. Um, so it's a big problem. And it's one of the reasons why they were listed on the Endangered Species Act in 2003. And we've been working really hard to try and bring the small tooth sawfish back um, to their former range and their former population numbers. So right now I wanna show you what it looks like when we catch these guys. So let me do, do so this is a video uh, showing kind of how we catch them. So we actually fish for them with long lines, which is just like it sounds. It's a long line with these like nine foot ga gangens hooked to it um, so that the sharks and rays that get caught on it have space to swim around. And then we um, fish with lady bait, ladyfish bait. Uh, we put 50 hooks in the water. And then if we're lucky, we uh, catch a sawfish. And so these guys, uh, you can see just how fast they are able to whip that rostrum, that saw around. Um, so this can be very dangerous, uh, which is why we tell anglers not to handle sawfish. It's dangerous for the anglers. It's dangerous for the sawfish. So if you ever do accidentally catch a sawfish, you want to just cut the line um, as close to the hook as possible and release them. So this is us working up the, the, the sawfish. You can see here, uh, my lab mate Bianca is drawing blood. So Bianca actually did her research on the stress physiology of the sawfish. So she would take blood before um, we started working them up first thing, as soon as we kind of got them under control. And then she would take blood after um, to kind of see how much stress we were putting on them. And um, luckily the sawfish don't get very stressed out from this. Um, so we're able to um, work them up without stressing them out too much. But this sawfish in particular, was having babies. So um, we flipped them over and then Dean sees these two little baby rostrum hanging out. And so this is him trying to figure out what do I do? Do I pull them out? <laughs> do we let them stay in there? And so they were worried about um, them staying in the, the birth canal or whatever while she's moving around and everything and they didn't want um, the babies to get hurt. So they ultimately decided to go ahead and pull out the two that were trying to come out on their own anyways. And so that's what um, he's doing now. He's playing little sawfish midwife to try and safely get those um, babies out of there. And um, you'll see here in a minute that He'll, he's just going to gently pull them out and they're adorable. So cute. Um, this is actually the first time that anyone was able to see a um, baby newborn sawfish. So we actually got to measure them. So our range of 70 to 80 centimeters at birth is um, based off of these sawfish um, that he was able to fresh, fresh out a mom measure. And um, so you'll see there's the first one, super cute. You can kind of see how crazy it is to look at that little baby compared to the mom, how much, how much they grow. It's pretty wild that they start out that small and get that big. So 
there's the there's the other guy coming out super cute and you can see here their little scar that they have um so just like kind of like how we have belly buttons because we're mammals so we attach to our mom um via placenta and so we have our little cord uh our umbilical cord that connects to so where we get nutrients from well these guys uh obviously they're not mammals they're fish so they actually get their nutrients from yolk so they have little individual yolk sacs attached to them um, and so they have a scar when they're born that has where that yolk sac was attached. And so they, um, you can kind of tell how recently they've been born um, by how um, healed their little scar is. So this is Andrea taking some measurements of the little guy and some pictures. And um, so this is a very exciting day, obviously. And this is the first pictures we have of, of newborn sawfish. You can see the sheath there really close. Um, and that little, little scar I was talking about. And then um, Bianca went ahead and took blood from them as well to see if they were stressed from the whole process. They, they also had very low stress levels, which is good. Um, so they didn't seem too stressed by all this. There's a zoom in of that little scar that I was talking about. And um, yeah, it's just pretty cool to, to see this. And what's happening now is they are pit tagging this sawfish. So similar to how we put microchips in our pets, like our cats and our dogs. Um, this is a little chip that if you scan it, it'll identify the, the number of the sawfish. So if you caught it later, you would be able to scan it and it just sits in there. So you're gonna be able to scan it later. So if we catch this, this little guy as an adult, um, we'll be able to, to say, hey, that's the same little guy that we um, had um, 10 years ago or whatever. So this is really cool. Um, technology that we use. For the big sawfish, we use what's called dart tags, which are actually little yellow things that stick out of their dorsal fin that have numbers on them. So um, it has an identification number. It also has the phone number that an angler can call um, if they see the number, if they're able to take a picture of it or whatever, so we can identify it. Um, so that just helps us track the animals there's the little baby sawfish getting released, swimming away, super cute. So yeah, so that's how that all happens. And um, I will tell you a little bit about what we do with that information. So we catch the sawfish, we measure them, we count the teeth, we take the blood, we take a fin clip to do genetics. Um, we put in an acoustic tag um, or, a, <clears throat> or a satellite tag um, so we can track their movements. And um, what we're basically trying to do is trying to figure out what's called critical habitat, which is, um, a legal term that means areas with physical and or biological features that are essential to the conservation of the species. So we already have small juvenile critical habitat designated uh, because they kind of stay near mangrove shorelines in these two areas that you see um, with the red lines. But when they get bigger, they actually swim out of those areas um, and they move around a lot. So we're trying to figure out where do they move? Where do they go when they're adults? Um, because that's not something that's really well known right now. So part of my project was to just track them using these two methods that I mentioned, acoustic and satellite telemetry, to figure out where they're going. Um, so that hopefully one day we can look at where they're going and then identify habitats that they're using while they're there so that we can also establish critical habitat for our large juveniles and adults. 
In addition to looking at places uh, that the sawfish use a lot and where they move, I was also interested in assessing bycatch risk. So like I mentioned, there's a lot of threats to sawfish, um, a lot of it being commercial fisheries. And so I was interested in understanding not only where the sawfish move, but when they're there and how likely they are to interact with commercial fishing based on the areas and the times that commercial fishermen are fishing at. So like I mentioned, we use a long line. So here's a picture of me and Dean setting a long line. Um, we, for this study, um, tagged a lot of sawfish. We tagged uh, 43 with the acoustic tags and 15 with the satellite tags. And we were using long lines mostly. We also had collaborators that used hook and line and drum line as well. And so we have, for the acoustic, we have to use what's called receivers. Um, and so you only get to know where a sawfish is when it's near a receiver. So we have used a whole multitude of receivers through a lot of different arrays or the FACT, ACT, and ITAG arrays, which are basically big collaborative arrays where researchers put receivers in the water to look at their specific species, but obviously the receivers are going to pick up any species with a tag that swims by, which before we started collaborating was like, okay, we just got these random tags. We're just going to throw that out. That's not the tags we're interested in. But we realized as scientists that if everyone has all these receivers in the water and our animals are swimming all over the place, wouldn't it be great if we also got the data from receivers that weren't ours? And so started these collaborative arrays where if you have um, IDs of animals that swam past your receiver that you don't belong to you, what we call orphan tags, you can upload them to this database and people can search for their tags and say, oh, hey, this person over here detected my animal on their receiver. And so we actually get a lot more data. So this way we were actually able to get, by the end of it, um, 90, over 90,000 detections on more than 350 different receivers all along the coast of Florida and one in Georgia. And so you can see here all the little black dots are our receivers. So we got to look at um, the Florida coast. You know, there's a couple of holes here and there, but it's a pretty good um, large scale study and something like this hasn't, hadn't been done before. So this was very exciting. So we had, as I mentioned, acoustic telemetry and satellite telemetry, the acoustic transmitter looked like this. Um, so not very big. We make a tiny little incision in the sawfish, stick it in, suture them back up. And it actually has uh, between a five and a 10 year battery life. Um, so we can actually track the sawfish for a long time and it's implanted internally. So we don't have to worry about it falling off. The satellite tags, we use pop-off satellite tags um, that are archival. So it collects the data um, as the sawfish is swimming around. It detaches from the animal after a certain number of days, um, between 60 and 150 days, depending on the particular tag. And it will release, it'll float to the surface. When it gets to the surface, it'll communicate with the satellites in the atmosphere and it'll send the data there. So we can actually pull it down. Um, and we don't necessarily have to collect the tag itself to get the data, um, which is great because they're sometimes hard to track down. The um, acoustic data is actually saved in the receiver itself, which you see at the bottom right here. Um, so we actually will look at this, pull this, pull this up, um, hook it up to a computer and download the data off of the receiver itself. So like I mentioned, I was looking at bycatch risk. Um, so I basically multiplied the probability of a sawfish being in an area by the probability of a commercial fisherman fishing in that area. 
um, and it created these uh, maps. So in blue, I have the probability of a sawfish being there. So the darker it is, the more likely it is for a sawfish to be there. Similarly, with the long line, the darker the orange is, the higher the probability that long lining is happening there. Um, and then I actually multiplied to get the risk value. So you can see here that some areas are riskier than others um, in terms of these three fisheries that I was looking at and some months are riskier than others. So what that tells us is uh, that there might be able to be some compromise where we can create what's called a time area closure where you just close down an area for a short period of time to commercial fishing, so fishermen. So you don't have to shut it down entirely. You just have to shut it down when the risk is highest. So like, for example, we have a really high risk in January. Well, if we didn't fish in that area in January, um, we would greatly decrease the number of sawfish that are, could potentially be caught in commercial fisheries but the fishermen would have the rest of the year to be able to fish in that area. So these are the kinds of things that are important to look at when we're making policy decisions, because you wanna make decisions that aren't gonna be detrimental to the fishermen, but are also going to protect the sawfish. So um, things that we learned so far, there are some sawfish that move around, some that don't. Um, for the sawfish that were tagged in the Charlotte Harbor area, um, it seems like the larger sawfish move and the smaller sawfish stay. You don't see that same pattern in the Florida Keys or the Indian River Lagoon um, sawfish, um, but that's likely because those sawfish are bigger than the Charlotte Harbor sawfish. So Charlotte Harbor probably has um, sawfish on the other side of that cutoff of where they don't really move a lot. Um, so that's what we kind of found. And then the sawfish actually move up both coasts. So some sawfish go up the East Coast, some sawfish go off the, up the Gulf Coast, but they all travel relatively at the same time, like within the same month, both when they leave and when they come back. Um, so that's interesting, even though they're using different coasts. There were a couple of sawfish that actually used both coasts, one that went up the East Coast one year and then one up the Gulf Coast the other, which is interesting. Because um, if you looked at the rest of them, you would think, oh, they pick a coast and they always go up that coast. Doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so there's a lot of different things that we're interested in looking at and um, we'll be publishing this data later as well. Um, so another thing that we looked at was networks. Um, so not just where are they at, but how do they move around? Um, are there areas that they stop at on the way to other areas? Um, are there areas that they keep coming back to? And so that's why we built this um, network. So this kind of shows how the sawfish are moving around. Obviously the sawfish are not walking across Florida. Um, these, it just shows that they went from this receiver on the Gulf side to this receiver on the Atlantic side uh, without passing any of these other uh, receivers, which means they probably went just in all of the holes where we don't have receivers or they went super deep and then came back on the other side. So um, this is something that we have to kind of figure out um, are there holes in our receivers where we're missing sawfish moving, um, which could be important for understanding where they're going because they'll disappear for a little bit and then they pop back up on another receiver and you're like, what have you been doing for six months? So um, this obviously is still a work in progress. And uh, like I mentioned, we have the battery lives five to 10 years. So we'll be continuing to track these animals and hopefully learn more and more over time. Um, but we were able to see already there's some areas that come out as being a little bit more important um, and more visited. Obviously the Keys and Charlotte Harbor, which we already knew that the small juveniles were staying there a lot. So it makes sense that the large juveniles go in and out of that area. 
um, but also um, the area off Cape Canaveral um, also seems to be important, which is surprising to us. Um, so we're hoping to learn more and more things and narrow this down even further so that eventually we can, um, the policy makers can identify some critical habitat. So I did lots of different maps just to look at if the movement changes throughout the seasons, it does. Do males move differently than females? Eh, kind of seems like um, the males move a little further north, um, but that's just a few individuals, so can't really say for sure. And then um, the mature sawfish seem to move a little bit more um, than the immature sawfish. So that's kind of like different things that we're looking at. And um, yeah, so basically all of that sawfish work sums up to be some sawfish move, some don't. Doesn't seem to matter whether they're male or female or mature or immature. Um, they seem to be moving further and further north, uh, which is good. Uh, that means that maybe they're going to start re-expanding their range back out. Um, we identified some important areas, figured out that um, this bycatch risk may be able to be mitigated with those time area closures that I was talking about. Um, and right now we don't really understand a lot about sawfish movements, but we definitely know a lot more than what we started with, which is always the goal in science. There's always more to learn, but as long as you're making steps, you're doing all right. Uh, so there's a lot of people that helped with this project. I won't name them all, but our funding sources obviously I tag fact and act members that share their data with us um, and everyone in my um, lab and all of my um, collaborators. So if you guys have any questions for me, feel free to leave them um, in the YouTube comments. I'll try and get to them and answer them. Um, if you have any more specific questions or long questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, you can also tweet your questions at me if you're into that, um, at Elasmogal. I also invite you to check out um, MISS, the organization that me and three other women founded, uh, Minorities in Shark Sciences. Got the website listed there. We are also on Twitter and Instagram at Miss underscore Elasmo and on Facebook, um, facebook.com slash Miss Elasmo. Uh, so with that, thank you all for watching. Um, be sure to check out all of the other great presentations that we have coming up. We have one coming up in just seven short minutes. Um, so be sure to check that out. We'll be um, having all of these talks for the next week um, from 8, p 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and they'll be all recorded. Um, so if you aren't able to make it because of time zones or busy schedule, never fear, they'll be available on the Miss YouTube channel after the live streaming. So thanks everybody and um, be sure to check out our future talks.